morning and I started my day. God's mercy was with me all of the way. His goodness stayed close by to meet all my needs. My Lord is taking good care of me. I'm never forsaken. I'm never of my past. I tell him I'm forgiven. It is buried at last. The bloodshed on Calvary now speaks for me. My Lord is taking good care of me. I'm never forsaken. I'm never alone. One day I'm moving to my brand new home. I'm blessed beyond me.
Jesus did for me. Yes, I know what Jesus did for me. At the peak of my mountains or the deepest of my lows, you said that you'd be with me and in your presence I would know that hell can't separate us and no power would prevail. So with faith I'll keep on singing and the story I will tell That even there He will keep me From all danger unaware He will shield me from the enemy Or Satan's evil snare His hand will lead, His hand will hold I can trust, trust his, his perfect plan. Cause no matter what, no matter where, he'll be with me even there. Are you searching for an answer in life's uncertain ways? Have you found yourself in trouble and it seems there's no escape? Let me tell you of our God above. He has promised he would stay. Always going with you from his presence. Never stray because even there he will keep me. From all danger unaware, he will shield me from the enemy or Satan's evil snare. His hand will lead, his hand will hold. I can trust his perfect plan. Cause no matter what, no matter where, he'll be with me even there. I can trust his perfect plan. Cause no matter what, no matter where. Yes, no matter what, no matter where. He'll be with me even there.
trust in Jesus, and I've learned to trust in God through it all. Through it all, I've learned to depend upon His word. in Jesus and I've learned to trust in God through it all through it all I've learned to depend upon His word yes I've learned to depend upon His word Do you remember when you were drowning in a sea of sin, going down for the last time before you called upon his name? Then he reached down his nail-pierced hand, and he lifted you out. So remember where you were back then, and thank him for where you are now. you long to serve him. Oh, but you didn't think that Jesus could ever use someone like you. Since he's brought you out, so remember where you were back then and praise him for where you are now and give him the glory. Those crowns of glory, 
cast them at the Savior's feet and give him the glory for what he's done in your heart. He took you from sin and strife and he gave a new start he took your broken life and he made you complete so those crowds of glory and cast them at the Savior's feet. I think about a New Testament passage of Scripture that, that describes the hour that you and I live in. My mind directly, Brother Kevin, goes to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. The Bible said, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And men shall be lovers of their own selves. Amen. We live in a what kind of generation? A selfie generation. Hello? Because we're lovers of our own selves. Boasters, proud. And then he said, blasphemers, disobedient parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers, those are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. It's not, not the hour in which we live in today. You, you could take those words off of, the, off of the latest news broadcast and it would describe to you and I the hour in which we live. And I, I, I tell you, I could, preacher, I could take a text in any of those verses and preach and uh, just about be shouted out of the pulpit in a lot of places. I could take a verse, I could take a text in verse number two and preach about the callous people. Where it says, loves their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, just callous in our day. It takes, I, in years gone by, in our parents' and grandparents' generation, they didn't have much. And it didn't, it didn't take the skies lighting up with the fireworks for them to get happy in Christ either. Amen. Amen. I mean, listen, we've been so blessed in our day. If God doesn't shake the building, if, if the floor doesn't move underneath our feet, we don't feel like God's done anything. Amen. Amen. We've got callous. I mean, do you remember when somebody used to say, turn your red book to page 139 and somebody would start to sing, years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. Knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. And they get to sing in mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. And buddy, you got to remembering the fact that you used to be on your way to hell. You used to be a sinner and your guilt and shame uh, just uh, could not be uh, uh, it was on your mind all the time until a service until a sermon until a song where God the Holy Ghost uh, awoke you up and convicted you of your sin and you got born again it did take 17,000 verses of a song uh, when you heard the word let's sing at Calvary and your hands were up in the air and you say man I've been there I've been there, I've been there. Yes, sir. Amen. Thing is, some of us just need the callousness knocked off of us. And I, I can get into chapter uh, 2 and verse 3, and, and I could preach on the carnal. I could preach about the LGBTQI and whatever other letter you want to put in that. Yeah. Amen. Hello, I'm not being ugly. They need to get saved just like any, they just need to get saved like everybody else. Amen, friend. I mean, man, I could preach about, I could preach about the liquor crowd. 
Man, I, I tell you, it seems like the dam has broke and liquor's running through the streets of America like never before. And now, not even just in the world, but there, our, our church leaders are saying, it's all right just to drink a little bit. My hind leg, it's all right. I tell you what, Brother Pre Kevin, Brother, Brother Brady, you know it's the truth. There ain't no preacher sitting behind their desk telling somebody on the other side it's all right to drink. Uh, listen to me. Uh, that sit there and watch the destruction that alcohol has brought to families. Amen. Amen. Everybody okay? See, you're helping me. You're, I can preach against the liquor crowd. I can preach about that car. I can hit verse 5 and get in there to that having a form of godliness and dying the power thereof. I can preach against the contemporary crowd. I never thought church looked like moss pits in a rock concert. I, I thought that's what you did at ACDC. I thought that's what you did. I'm, I, don't even, I, I don't even know who to preach against anymore. I've been so removed from that, Brother Brady, for so long. I don't even know who to preach against. I mean, back in the day, Def Leppard and Guns and Roses and Aerosmith and all. I thought that's how you acted when you went and got high and got drunk at a rock concert. Not at church. You listen, they say, boy, we're getting with the Lord. I tell you, when I get with the Lord in the holiness of God, I'm not wanting to, listen, headbang. I'm wanting to get in a corner somewhere and get on my face before God because I realize I should have been in hell. But by the goodness of God, friend, I'm a child of God. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Everybody all right? Don't get nervous. I didn't drive four hours not to preach. Amen, Amen friend. Amen. And I could preach that and you'd help me and shout me down. But can I help you tonight? The liquor crowd's not affecting our service this evening. Amen. The pornography crowd is not sitting on our pews tonight. And uh, may I say to you, listen, they're not marching out in the parking lot and the LGBTQIA and everything else, amen. They, they are not affecting our service tonight. But did you hear what the preacher said just a moment ago when he stood behind the pulpit? He said, man, we ought to thank God. We ought to thank the Lord. Now don't get mad at me. But four of us moved. How many people are in here? Evangelistically, 800. <laughs> Truthfully, 200 people. And man, God ain't done nothing but for four people. Hello? Brother Jerry said he called me coming up the road and I was rejoicing with him about the day. And he said, preacher, he said, you remember when we first came? He said, man, we got to worship. He said, I just asked the Lord this week to let us worship God. Amen. Amen. We need that every once in a while. Amen. You know what my favorite class in school was? Recess. Are you listening? I mean, I made A's in math and I made, I made A's in science and, and I made A's in English. I, but I, I didn't like them desks because I didn't fit in them. I wanted to get out, and go out on the playground and kick a ball or wrestle or fight or do something. I mean, I wanted to be active. Can I tell you what? Every once in a while, child of God, the Lord, he'll let you come out of the classroom. He'll let you come off the service field. And he'll let you get in a good service. And he'll let you unplug from burdens. He'll let you unplug from struggles. He'll let you unplug from discouragement. And God will let you see what the Lord's done for you. And he'll let you worship God. And you'll be about as refreshed as I was when I got to go run around on the playground and you'll be more ready to serve God tomorrow and the next day uh, when we worship again. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. So if the liquor crowd's not bothering us and the pornography crowd's not bothering us and, the, and all that other mess ain't bothers, what's, what's hindering our services? There's a word in verse 2. Unthankful. Well, Lord, but preacher, you don't know what the Lord's not done. I've been asking him. Let me ask you something. 
I would say to you, he's done more for you than he hasn't done. Amen. He's answered more prayers than he hasn't answered. Amen. Brother Kevin, we don't deserve to be here. Brother Brady, we don't deserve to be here. We don't deserve to be in the ministry of a God telling us faithful. And he put us in the ministry. Praise God. I don't have to preach. I don't have to. There ain't nobody cracking a whip at me or telling me I ought to live right. And if I don't listen, thank God. I live because I love him. Or we're constrained by the love of God. I should be in hell tonight of my sin and the wrath of God all abide on me. But as a 13 year old boy, I repented of my sin. I got birthed into the family of God and that's why I love him. You realize the word think and think come from the same root word. So if you're not thankful you ain't thinking much. Because if you get to thinking much, it won't be long till you'll start thinking. Amen. I was going to say this sometime this week, and the Lord let me. Hebrews 11, the Bible said this that Sarah judged him faithful who had promised. Hello? Y'all hear me? Judged him faithful. By faith Noah, by faith Abel, by faith Enoch, by faith Abraham. Hebrews 11. What a chapter. It lists the greatest of the greats. But you know what I don't find in Hebrews 11? When I get to Abraham's story. Anybody watch Fox News lately? Anybody read the newspaper in the last two weeks? All you see, Brother Brady, is Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran, all that mess, Brother Kevin. All of them over there fighting is they hate, they hate Abraham. They hate the Jews. Amen. But you know what I don't find in Hebrews 11? I don't find words like Genesis 12 where he went down to Egypt. And I don't find Genesis 15, I don't find Hagar, and I don't find Ishmael. You realize what's going on in Israel is a direct result of what happened in Genesis 15. I mean, listen, when uh, uh, they took matters into their own hands, and uh, listen, Ishmael was born. Ishmael was not the son of promise. Isaac was the son of promise, and there's no other bad decision outside of Genesis 3 that's caused more bloodshed in the history of mankind uh, other than what Abraham did in Genesis 15. But when you get to Hebrews 11, I don't see Egypt. I don't see Ishmael. I don't see Hagar. You say, why is that? Well, uh, uh, there's something real important uh, uh, between Genesis 15 uh, and Hebrews 11. Uh, you say, what is it? Well, uh, if you were to look at Luke 23, 33, uh, and there they came to the place which is called Calvary, and there they crucified him. Uh, I tell you the reason it don't mention it in Hebrews 11, uh, uh, because it's on the other side of Calvary. I wonder if I knew your story, and you knew my story uh, from Genesis 15, uh, people would turn away. Uh, they wouldn't want to fellowship with us. Uh, uh, but thank God, uh, I know this side of the story uh, uh, where it's forgiveness uh, and it's mercy uh, and it's love. Uh, I mean, somebody ought to thank God uh, uh, that everybody around you uh, uh, doesn't know your own story, but they know the story on this side uh, of the blessed work of Calvary. Hallelujah. You remember, Miss Heather, years ago, the girls' homes used to sing, if you had known me before I knew Jesus, you'd understand my love. Hallelujah. If we'd have known each other on the other side, Ain't no telling what that would have turned out to be. But I'm glad we got to know each other on this side. Hallelujah. 
Everybody okay? Amen. Are you listening to me? Turn your Bible to Psalm 107. Psalm 107. I'm talking about, I just thought I'd testify a little bit about what the preacher said. Amen. Psalm 107. Amen. Everybody got your Bible open? All right. Let's look at verse 1. I'm sure your Bible says, if you feel like it, give thanks unto the Lord. I, I, I met my, I'm sorry, I missed a, if you've got all your prayers answered, give thanks unto the Lord. If you didn't make a mistake today, give thanks unto the Lord. Surely, maybe I didn't remember that right. Or did it just say, oh, 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 give thanks unto the Lord. And you know what is attached to that statement? Nothing that is done, but something that is. <laughs> if you relegate your praise and worship to the things he's done or the things that he's doing, your perception may be clouded and your memory may fail. But if you'll relegate your worship to the fact when you got up this morning, uh, uh, whether you were in pain, uh, whether you were uh, in peril, uh, uh, whether you were discouraged or whether you were happy, uh, if you would just relegate your praise uh, and thanksgiving and worship uh, uh, to the fact, oh, give thanks uh, unto the Lord uh, for his good. When the sun came up this morning in the portals of glory, he's good. And when she sets in just a moment, a neighbor in the portals of heaven, he's still good. So when you woke up and draw your breath, you ought to thank God that you're still breathing his air. And the reason you are is not what he's doing, but it's who he is. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. And his mercy endureth most of the time. Or his mercy endureth when you're not callous and when you're not carnal. Or his mercy endureth. Hey, preachers. His mercy endureth when we're not put out with our church family. Oh, did I say that out loud? Well, if you'd have heard what the preacher said, he might have said what he said because he knew what you did last week. You say, well, he shouldn't be snooping. He don't have to snoop. You put it on Facebook. <laughs> Hashtag, you are in, well, I better not say that next word. They had those back in the day. They were called a village. Well, I didn't say it. <laughs> hey, man. I mean, we ain't got to call Magnum P.I. or Leroy Jethro Gibbs. God help. You put it for the world to see. And you know sometimes even when the Lord's mercy, our mercy runs out, and even when the Lord's long suffering, our long suffering, I wish it didn't. I wish I was more patient and, and more long suffering at times. Uh, but when I look at folks and they know better uh, and they realize they, they've been taught and taught and taught, you know what? Sometimes we get put out. Y'all pray for us. But I put my britches on just like you do, sir. But it didn't say as long as a preacher wasn't upset or discouraged. But it said his mercy endureth forever. 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 Oh, give thanks to the Lord for his good. That's who he is. His mercy endureth forever. That's what he has. That's what he gives. But look at, look at these verses. Look at verse 8. Everybody look at your Bible. Oh, that men 
would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. Is that what he said? Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. Now let's have a little hermeneutics class right here. How many times does the Bible have to say something for it to be the Bible? Talk to me. How many times? Just one. So there's, so Psalm 107 verse 8 is as much Bible as John 3.16. But there's only one John 3.16. And, and, and Romans 107 verse 8 is, is, is as much Bible as the only Romans 5.8 that's in there uh, that said that God committed his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hey, somebody, somebody tell me where, where the option is in that verse. Where, where's the option at? That, that sounds like me. That's a request and a command from heaven. Hello? Everybody, talk to me now. So you know, yeah, they see, everybody won't, they, they, they think the greatest preaching to do is that gospel preaching because once they get saved, they're like, praise God. But they don't want you to get in them other parts of the Bible that tells how we ought to, how to live and who we're responsible to and who we're accountable to and how we ought to talk and how we ought to look and how we ought to act and how we ought to, they don't let, listen, let's go back to John, th- amen, friend. You say, why would I not like that verse? Because if you're going to do that verse right there in a corporate worship service, you're probably going to have to embarrass your flesh. Uh, You're probably going to have to lay your pride down. Uh, You're probably going to have to stand up in the place uh, and put your hands in the air uh, and lift your voice uh, and vocally give God glory uh, and demonstrative, give God thanksgiving and praise. Uh, You say, well, I just can't do that. Well, I might believe that. Had I not been a high school basketball referee for 15 years and a high school umpire for years and a college baseball, I I might believe that. But you let me call a foul on sissy. And them little people that say I'm not emotional, their mother's fangs start to grow in their eye teeth and their, and their, and, and the leaders in their neck begin to poke out. And, the, and all of a sudden the blood that was pumping from their heart is now crawling up their neck. Amen. And a man that looks like a, a volcano about to blow. Yeah, you're emotional about something. It's just not the goodness of God. Okay, verse, verse 8. Hey, fellas, put up there verse 15. What does it say? Wow. The same thing. How many times makes it the Bible? That's two times in 15 verses. Matter of fact, that's two times in seven verses. Hey, what about, hey, fellas, what about verse 21? Man, all things changing is that little reference at the bottom. That's three times in 14 verses. What about, what about verse number 31? Oh, it just changed at the bottom again. What about that? You think he's trying to make a point that he wants you to praise God? You a preacher? Yeah, I saw you in outline book. I'm about to give you an outline in just a minute. Amen. In a minute. Let me tell you what my preacher told me. He said, you'll never be able to work for him like you ought to work for him until you first learn how to worship him. I, I, I've known some young men that were afraid to worship when other preachers were in the place because they were afraid if they got full of God, Brother Brady, it might cost them a meeting. Let me just help you there. If it costs you a meeting, good riddance to that meeting. Amen. 
I, I listen, I, I, I'm let you, Brother Jerry, you've been with Brother Brave. We've been in all kinds, we've been in good places and we've been in dead places and we've been in large places and we've been in small crowds. And I'm just going to tell you something, son. I'm Brother Mark at Haynes and I'm Brother Mark at Wahoo and I'm Brother Mark at Charity and I'm Brother Mark anywhere we go. And if God just gets me just right, amen, friend. If I get full, I'll shout wherever I am. I mean, by myself with a crowd on a dirt road in Alabama when there ain't but 30 people under the tent, two little sisters are singing and they get to singing uh, across the miles. Somebody's praying for you uh, and God gets in my spirit, lets me know uh, uh, that somebody prayed for me. Uh, I shouted a half a mile down the dirt road by myself uh, and a half a mile back. Uh, you say, what were they going to do when they got preaching time? Well, somebody else could preach uh, or they could wait till I got back uh, because I was enamored. I was looking uh, for the one who pulled me out of hell. Hallelujah. You say, why would I praise the Lord? Well, the psalmist writes it. Look at verse 3. And he gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary place. In a solitary, in a, let me get that right, solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. I like this next verse because it happens in every one of these occasions. He said, then they cried unto the Lord in, hello, some of your wait until your problem gets fixed. Don't read this verse if that's how you think your worship ought to be. It said, then they cried to the Lord in, in, in their trouble. And he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. Look at verse 9. For he satisfied the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. You say, preacher, why in the world would I give God glory tonight if you just knew what was in my heart? If you knew the sorrow that I was experiencing and the burden and the difficulty well, uh, uh, friend, if you'll just take a moment and think, uh, uh, you might have been like these folk were, uh, hungry and thirsty. The Bible said hungry and thirsty. Uh, uh, their soul fainted in them. Uh, how many times in your Christian life uh, have you been starving for a fresh piece of bread? Uh, and man, you've been thirsting for a little drink uh, out of the well. David said, oh, that I had a drink uh, uh, from the well of Bethlehem. Uh, uh, but how many times uh, have you gone to your secret place? Have you gone to a service? Have you heard a preaching on the telephone or wherever it might be? And all of a sudden, God broke you a fresh piece of bread and he dipped his hand in the well of grace and mercy and gave you a drink. I'm telling you, thank God the reason that I can praise the Lord is because he feels the faint man. How many times have you come up to the house of God faint thinking you couldn't make it a again, uh, but then the God of heaven uh, walked into the middle of the service, uh, uh, sat down in your vehicle with you, uh, made a telephone call to you uh, when you just could not see your way out, uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, out of nowhere, uh, uh, came the presence of God Almighty, uh, and he filled uh, the faint man. Ever been there? Ever been there? At night, you're talking about y'all crawling to the altar. Y'all wasn't crawling because of joy. Brother Brady, I've heard you preach right there about some faint times in y'all's life, ministry. But boy, when our preachers couldn't do it, our, the ones we've looked to, our heroes, couldn't give us the drink we needed, the bread we needed, the God of heaven out of nowhere. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 
Amen. Brother Larry, I'd have to say in the, in the, in the aging years when you wish you could do what you've done in, in years gone by and the fact is your body just won't cooperate. Uh, there's been some faint times. Uh, you wish you could preach like you did as a young man uh, or worship like you did as a young man. Uh, uh, but aren't you glad in the, in the secrecy of your study uh, of a God that you bragged about for years and years uh, uh, can still walk in there uh, and cast you a little piece of bread uh, and give you a fresh drink of water. I'm telling you, child of God, you may came here tonight faint and thinking, man, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I'm telling you, he's satisfied of the hungry soul. You can give him glory because he feels the faint man. Look at your Bible. Verse 10. Such as sit in darkness and a shadow of death being bound in affliction and iron. Next verse, fellas. Because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. And then verse 12, therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down. There was none to help. Verse 13, then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. Verse 14, he, you, know what verse, you know what the number 14 is in the King James Bible? It's a deliverance. And what did he do in verse 14? He brought them out. Amen. Out of darkness and the shadow of death and break their bands asunder. I'm telling you, thank God for it. Listen, come help me, preacher. Here, put your hands together. How many of you come to church like that tonight? Oh, preacher's happy. Brother Jared, Brother Jared's happy. He preached last night. Got to touch of God. Man, you want to worship God. And you, you, you see the preacher exhort about being thankful and Nehemiah, you, you, he talks about that. And you say, man, I want to praise God. Go ahead and worship. But see, you don't let the devil bind you up. You say, why do you say the devil let me? Let me see, when you, were, when you were lost, you were a child of hell. When you got saved, God took you out of the family of hell, a family of darkness, and put you in the family of God. You know why I don't spank Nolan and you don't spank Riley and Carter? I'm not his daddy, and you're not their daddy. So listen, if the devil's got ground in our life, it's not because he took it, it's because we gave it to him. He has no authority in your life. That's not charismatic. That's King James Bible for him. I mean, that's if he's got ground in your life, you gave it to him. And when he came in, he locked you down. And you see the singers worship. And you hear the preacher worship. But you're brilliant. And he's bound you uh, because you contemn the counsel of the Most High. Uh, but I'm telling you, I serve a God uh, who can walk into this meeting uh, and break the bands asunder. Uh, and you can sing what's like a bird uh, in prison I dwelt. Uh, no freedom from my sorrow I felt, but Jesus came and listened to me, and glory to God, he set me free. How long has it been since you've been free in church? See, you don't just feel the faint man. He frees the fettered man. And you may be the one that let him bind you, but he'll be the one that comes in and breaks the chains. Boy, Brother Lance got it right, didn't he, when he said he broke the chains of sin and sorrow. Amen. Number three, look at your Bible. Look at verse 17. Fools, because of their transgression and because their iniquities are afflicted, their soul abhorreth all manner of meat. They draw near to the gates of death. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out. I like verse 20 a lot. He said he sent his word. And heal them and deliver them from their destructions. Are you listening? Hallelujah for the power of the Word of God. Amen. And then he said, He said, He delivered them out of their distresses. Fools, the Bible said, because of their transgression. See, he don't just, he don't just feel the faint man. And he don't just free the fettered man, but he fashions the foolish man. How many of you white hair folks remember Flip Wilson? 
The devil made me do it. Well, let me just say this to you. We give the devil a whole lot more credit than he's due. I'll be honest with you. If, if, if there's any in here that we're, that's on the devil's radar, it may be one or two. Hello? They probably ain't none of us in here making that kind of impact that, that, that we're on the devil's radar. Amen? Let me just say this. Most of the trouble that we have in our life, the devil didn't do it. We did it. Fools because of their transgression. But what about a God when we know better and we mess up, he still sends his word. I think some of the most beautiful, we say that I think some of the most beautiful words in our King James Bible is in Jeremiah 18 when he talks about the potter and the clay. The Bible said when the potter, when the clay was marred in the potter's hand, he said he put it on the wheel and he made it over again as it seemed good to the potter. I tell you this, you say, well, preacher, if you just knew how bad I messed up, you'd know he, God can't fix it. If somebody told you that, it wasn't the Holy Ghost, it wasn't the Word of God, that was the devil. I just told you where he said he made it over again and seemed good to the potter. You say, preacher, why should I thank God? Well, if you can't thank him because he feels the faint man, thank him because he frees the fettered man. And if you can't do it for that, just go ahead and thank him that he fashions the foolish man. How many times as parents have we looked at our children and said, man, you knew better than that. How many times has the Lord looked at us and said, you knew better than that. Y'all come back, get ready to sing, Brother Jared, I'm done. Notice the last one. Notice what the Bible said in verse 24. These see the works of the Lord and wonders in his deep, for he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of their trouble. Anybody been there? They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm with calm so that the waves are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet, so he bringeth them unto their desired haven. He doesn't just free the fettered man and fashion the foolish man and feel the faint man, but he finds the fallen man. Do you remember when you were going down for the last time? You remember that? I wonder, I wonder as pastors if we could see what the Lord sees. You sit up there on the front and like I do. And, and I can't always read it when they're coming in. A lot of times I can. Our people are creatures of habit. Amen. I can, walk, I, I can watch how some of our men and ladies walk into church and know how, how, what kind of morning it's been. I mean, when them 95-pound women walk like they 475 pounds, it ain't been a good morning. I mean, when they slam the door and the, and, and the glass about falls out of the windows of the church, it ain't been a good morning. One of the reasons I like to sit where I walk, there's sometimes folks can hide when they come in, but when the Holy Ghost gets to moving, they don't normally hide how they react to His moving. It gets on them so quick, sometimes they can't help but let you see what, what their heart's like. Amen. I wonder if you could have spiritually looked tonight as your folks come in. I wonder how many of them. You staggered in like a drunk man. That wit's in. That wit's in. And you're thinking, how in the world am I going to make it? Well, every one of them cried unto the Lord in their trouble. Some years ago, Riley was about, I guess Riley was about a little less than three years old. And Carter was about three or four months old, I guess. We used to go eat lunch at a place called the West Family Restaurant up above between Helen in Cleveland where our church where our church is at and 
Right, Mama had to go to the restroom after we ate. I took the boys outside. It was a, it was a pretty cool winter afternoon, probably 40, 41 degrees. And they had a little koi pond out there. And I got redneck boys. We don't look at fish. We try to catch fish. Hello. Amen. We, we not, you know, we're not. They, they, they want to put a hook in at the aquarium. Can I get a witness? Amen. Now, I'll be honest with you, Brother Kevin, I don't like fishing. I like catching. And if we're not catching, I ain't fishing long. Amen. Hello. Amen. Amen. I'm too OCD and too high strung to sit out there and look at the water. If we're going to be out there in the water, let's put some skis in there, wait, but let's do something. Amen. Staring at water, just watching that hook bob up and down. God help us. That put me in a loony bin. O'Reilly got squatted down. I, I, I would show you how to do it, but you'd have to get a come along to get me back up. He squatted down and went. There was a big old koi in there about that long. He never did try to catch them little ones, but when that big one came by, boy, he's a, he a watching it. Every time he come by, he sunk a little bit lower and got a little bit water closer to that water. And here that fish come, and I told him the time before, I said, you better be careful. You're going to be in that water. He didn't even look up. Here that big one came again, and boy, before I knew it, he had swiped for that thing. And head over heels, he went in that koi pond. 40 degrees. 20, he's probably about 34 months old. And he could have stood up. It wasn't that deep, and even it, it, he was small then. But he could, have pro he could have stood up enough to get his head out of the water. But he wasn't thinking. And Brother Brady, he rolled over on his back. And he looked up with a sheer look of terror. Here I am with Carter, even at three or four months old, he was built like a bowling ball. I mean, now he's like you, he's got abs. Well, I do too, mine are just more, mine are more valuable than y'all's because I've got mine hid. I've got mine protected, amen. You know, you've got them out there for everybody to see, you know, you and Carter do. Amen. And he rolled over. Here I got this other big youngin in my hand. How many, now Brother Larry, you'll remember, these other folk may not remember. You remember years ago when the funeral directors and the bankers and the preachers all wore them Florsheim Imperial. I mean, they got more, they got more miles than Michelin tires, praise God. And they weighed as much as a truck. I had me a pair of those, my dad bought me a pair. And there my baby was in that water. Before I knew what I'd done, I'd done stepped off in that water, about knee deep in that koi pond, in a suit. We stayed at church on Sunday afternoons. I had no other suit with me. I had no other dress shoes. And I stepped off in that water with a baby in my hand, my preaching clothes on, and I took my hand and I reached down there and I got him by the, I got him by his clothes, and I pulled him out of the water, and I set him. Mama got in the car. She said, what happened? I said, what do you mean? She said, I followed the wet footprints all the way to the crook. How many times in your Christian life you fell in? He stepped off in that water. Pulled you out. Set you down. I think every one of us can identify with all four of these. Here's the question. We know we've been in there, but I wonder how many of us are going to come say, Lord, I just want to say thank you for filling the faint man. Lord, I want to give you glory for freeing me when I was a fettered man. Lord, I want to thank God tonight that you fashioned me even though I've been foolish. And you, and you found me when I was fallen. I tell you what, if we get real thankful about that, ain't nobody going to have to exhort you to worship the rest of the week. Because when they get to singing something like that, all you're going to think about is when you were bobbing up and down. 
one down. And all of a sudden, a nail pierced hand picked you up. Or when you came to church for months and weeks and maybe even years and bound and remember the service, God cut you loose. It set you free. They're going to say, what you going to do? Oh, that men will praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful work to the children of men. You going to thank him? You going to give him glory? You going to worship him? Or are you going to sit there and be one of the unthankful that, that marks the end times? If there's any people that ought to be thankful to God in this day and hour, it's the child of God. Lost people, I don't, listen, lost people, they ought to act like lost people. But on the same token, saved folk need to get back to acting like saved folk. Amen. We're staying. It is a joy and a privilege to be able to know that you've tuned in. And I pray that today that the word of God that was shared will be a blessing to you. If somehow, some way that the Lord has spoke to your heart, and maybe you're uh, sitting where you are and you don't know for sure that you're saved by the grace of God and you've ever trusted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, then I want you to know that the Word of God says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible makes it very plain, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You say, how do I get saved? You have to trust in Christ and Christ alone. Repent of your sin and then know as the Bible says where Jesus says, I am the way. And I pray that today that that would be your desire to be able to seek out for the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to trust him as a Lord and Savior. If you do that today and you repent of your sins and you take him as your Savior, would you do us a favor and contact our church office at 336-788-0551? We would love to be able to speak with you. We would love to be able to encourage you, maybe be able to help you find a local church no matter where you are today. And maybe even possibly disciple you. So we want to say thank you so much. And we are definitely going to be praying for you in this ministry that our church has. If you know you're saved and maybe the Lord spoke to you in a different way. And there's something heavy on your heart. Again, that same number, if you can contact us, we'll be so thankful to be able to reach out and be able to speak with you. But again, on behalf of the church and myself, thank you so much. And may God bless you.